Good morning, class. So welcome to another um, discussion for our immunology serology class. So for today, we'll be continuing our discussion about the immunological disorder. So last meeting, we talked about your hypersensitivity. So hopefully you are already um, understanding what hypersensitivity is all about. So that is chapter 14 of your Stevens. Now let's move forward to chapter 15. Um, and this can be found on page 266 of your Stevens. So for this morning, we will be talking about your first autoimmune disease. Okay, um, We'll be talking about what is autoimmune disorders to start off to for starters. And then we will be discussing what is your systemic lupus erythematosus. And then for the succeeding um, classes, we'll be talking about the other autoimmune diseases and then um, finish up our lecture for this week. So let's get started um, and let go straight ahead to our discussion. So when we talk about autoimmune disorders, um, this is a particular condition in which damage to organs or tissues are results of having or because of the presence of autoantibody or autoreactive cells. So always remember that our immune system, okay, our immune system is very much capable of reacting to foreign substances, which we call your antigens or immunogens. So our body, um, specifically your immune system, defends us from microorganisms that might cause infection. And last meeting, when we talk about hypersensitivity, we talk about how our immune system can respond negatively or exaggeratedly to harmless antigens. Now, when we talk about autoimmune disorders, we do have now an auto, um, an autoimmune response, okay, to our own self or to our own antibody. And with this, okay, with this, as Paul Ehrlich described this phenomenon, this is horror autotoxicosis or meaning fear of self-poisoning. Why self-poisoning or why um, horror autotoxicus? Because our own immune system is attacking our own tissue or our own organs. Now, for us to be able to understand autoimmune disorder, let us talk about first some important um, terms that we need to know before we dig into the different autoimmune disorders. Now, um, in a normal individual, okay, in a normal individual without autoimmune disorder, each and every one of us has self-tolerance. Now, what is self-tolerance? Self-tolerance is the ability of our immune system to accept self-antigen. So all um, I want you guys to remember that even our body, we do contain um, different antigens. Our cells have different glycoproteins on its surface, and those are also considered antigen. But because we do have self-tolerance, our immune system do not initiate an immune response, okay? Our immune system do not initiate a response against them. Why? Because it is our own. If you guys could remember your natural killer cell, okay? If you guys could remember our natural killer cell, our natural killer cell is capable of identifying our own cells from those virally infected cells. That's why it is able to tolerate those antigens coming from our body. Similarly, in a wider scale, our immune system is also capable of that. And that is what we call self-tolerance. And when we talk about self-tolerance, okay, again, this is the ability of our immune system to accept, okay, self antigens okay self antigens that's why when you have autoimmune disease okay when you have autoimmune disease it is because of a result of your loss of self tolerance your immune system can no longer tolerate our own or our self antigen that's why they respond negatively to these antigen and there are two types of tolerance we have central tolerance and we also have your peripheral tolerance. When we say central tolerance, this occurs in our central lymphoid organs. Okay, It occurs in our central lymphoid organs such as your thymus okay, and even your bone marrow. If you guys could remember, when we talk about your, um, your T-cell differentiation, there is a very scrutinized process 
where our T lymphocytes go through. And sometimes, okay, if these lymphocytes are against or if they react to our self-antigen, they are deleted. This is now your clonal selection, if you guys would remember, in your T cell differentiation. It is a very um, tedious process in which your T cell are scrutinized and only a little percentage of your T cell are um, passing that stage, okay? Kukunti lang yung mga T, cell, T lymphocytes natin that are capable of um, accomplishing or passing through that um, stage when it comes to your T cell differentiation. Now, please do remember that your central tolerance, okay, when it comes to your central tolerance, as your T cell mature, okay, um, they would encounter self antigens. And if they react with the self antigen, they will be deleted. Okay, again, if they react to our self antigen, they will be deleted. This is a, the process of central tolerance. Now, um, we also do have your peripheral tolerance. When we say peripheral tolerance, these now, okay, in your, your peripheral tolerance, this now is the process um, that is happening on your secondary lymphoid organ. So what are your secondary lymphoid organ? All other organs aside from your bone marrow and your thymus that are belonging to your immune system, your spleen, your lymph nodes, your Peyer's patches, those are your secondary uh, lymphoid organ. And the same thing, um, when your um, lymphocytes are also reactive, okay, if your lymphocytes are also reactive to your self-antigen, they will also get deleted. Okay, they will also get deleted. So the bottom line about self-tolerance is that if you have um, an immune component, okay, an immune component, specifically our lymphocytes, if your lymphocytes are attacking our self-antigen, our or our own cells, our own tissue, they will be deleted. Okay, they will be deleted. Now, if you lost this, um, if you lost this capability, if your self tolerance is no longer in place or is no longer um, normal, then that's the time that you develop autoimmune disorders. Okay, you develop autoimmune disorders. So that's one scenario in which you can develop autoimmune diseases. Okay, you can. Um, you can develop autoimmune diseases. Of course, there are also other factors such as genetics. Um, if you guys could remember your major histocompatibility complex, in the short arm of your chromosome 6, there are different um, loci, of your, uh, loci of your gene. And um, if you have a specific, um, a specific um, mutation on those, on those genes, it can, okay, it can uh, lead to the development of an autoimmune disease like your um like take for example your type 1 diabetes to name a few so all of those your alkaloting spondylitis so those are diseases because of um autoimmune diseases because of your uh because of genetics now there are also other um other um other cases in which your autoimmune diseases are due to other in, um, are influence of other endogenous and environmental factors. So some it can be because of your hormonal influence, hormonal influences. Okay, it can also be because of tissue trauma or release of cryptic um cryptic antigens. When we say cryptic antigens, these are um hidden antigens in our in our tissue that when is uh, released it elicit an immune response, thereby attacking our own cell, our, our own um, cells and our own tissue. Now, aside from hormonal um, influence, tissue trauma that leads to the release of your cryptic antigen, it can also be because of your microbial infections. Now, what about microbial infection? Remember that when it comes to microbial infection, there is what we call your molecular mimicry. Okay, when we say molecular mimicry, there are some individual viral or bacterial agent that contains antigen that closely resemble our own antigen. So when we say molecular mimicry, it's very much synonymous to your um, cross-reactivity. Now, there are some bacteria, there are some viruses that contains um, antigen, antigens 
um, in these microorganisms or in these pathogens that resemble our self-antigen. A good example of that will be your poliovirus VP2 that resembles your acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is a very um, common molecule within our body, specifically in our nervous system. Now, we also have your measles virus P3 that resemble the myelin basic protein of our nerves. And you also have papillomavirus VP2, which resembles your insulin receptors. Now, because of this molecular mimicry, okay, because of this molecular mimicry, take for example, you have poliovirus, missiles, um, virus, or papillomavirus. These, these, um, these um, viruses, they elicit or they trigger our immune system to develop or to release a um, an antibody directed against them. And because of molecular mimicry, because of these, um, uh, the antigen of these viruses resemble our own antigen, what happened now is that there's a possibility that the antibody that is supposed to, um, uh, that is supposed to um, bind or attack your poliovirus, it can also now attack your acetylcholine and vice versa. And the same thing is true when it comes to measles. The antibody for your measles virus can now um, can now um, react with your myelin basic protein. Your papillomavirus antigen can now react with your insulin receptors. And because of this molecular mimicry, okay, and because of this molecular mimicry, we now have what we call your bystander effect. Okay, this bystander effect happens when your microorganism induces a local inflammatory response that recruits leukocytes and stimulate your antigen-presenting cell to release cytokines that activate your T cell. Okay, activate your T cell. This is the way on how your organism can cause autoimmunity. Now, take for example, you have your poliovirus. Your poliovirus would cause a local inflammatory response, recruiting your leukocytes, your antigen-presenting cells thereby releasing your cytokines that activate your T cell. Now, because um, the, antibody, uh, the, the antibody that will be produced can also bind not only to your poliovirus, but to also to your acetylcholine, it can now, okay, it can um, cause now your autoimmunity. And this is how your microorganisms, okay, in the bystander effect, okay, your bystander effect, this is how your organisms, specifically your uh, microorganisms, um, your microorganisms um, causes autoimmunity. Okay, they causes autoimmunity. So, with this mechanism, okay, with this mechanism, um, because of the molecular mimicry, because um, they are structurally similar, okay, with our self antigen, okay, instead. Of the micro, um, instead of the microorganism, diba? instead of the microorganisms being attacked by those um, antibody and by the, those cytokines, our self um, antigens are the one being attacked now. Our um, our own cells, our own tissue is the one being attacked now. So with this, okay, auto auto antibody, auto immunity can develop. Okay, auto immunity can develop so that's how your micro that's one way or on how your microorganisms okay that's one way how your microorganisms um causes your um autoimmune um autoimmunity so aside from molecular mimicry um they can um also um have bystander effect and aside from that they there are the third way or the third um, manner on how microorganisms um, induce, okay, will probably induce autoimmunity is through your super antigens. So super antigens, these are proteins, okay, these are proteins that are produced by various microorganisms that has the ability, okay, it has the ability to bind to both your major histocompatibility complex class 2 and your tall, uh, your T, T, uh, TCRs, okay, your TCR. So when your TCRs, okay, when your TCRs and your MHC class 2, okay, when your TCR and your MHC class 2,
Okay, again, going back, okay, your super antigens, this is another way on how your microorganism induce an autoimmunity or uh, rather autoimmune um, disorders. Now, um, these super antigens are also proteins that are capable of binding to both your M M MHC or your major histocompatibility complex class 3 and your TCRs. Again, TCRs, these are your T cell receptors, okay, regardless of the antigen specificity. Okay, so with the super antigens, okay, with the super antigens, um, they can cause a non-specific activation of your T cell, resulting to um, the activation of your polyclonal T cell, and because of the uh, multiplication of your T cell, okay, because your T cell now will uh, proliferate upon activation, it can release a massive cytokine, and remember. Um, your cytokines can cause cytokine score, storm, um, thereby affecting our own tissue and our cells. So again, um, our microorganisms, diba? our microorganisms can lead to autoimmunity by molecular mimicry, by bystander effect, and by causing super antigens. Now, um, if you want to read more about that, you can go to your chapter 13. Um, that could be found around page 200. Um, 68 onwards, okay, 268 onwards. But moving forward, okay, I hope um, I was able to further explain to you guys um, the basic on how our self-tolerance and also other factors like hormones, genetics, um, your cryptic antigens, and also your microorganisms can lead to autoimmunity. Now, when we talk about autoimmunity then, okay, when we talk about your autoimmunity, um, it can be further classified into um, into two, okay? It can be further classified into two. So what are those two classifications of your autoimmunity? They can be organ-specific or they can also be systemat systemic or non-organ-specific. When we talk about um, organ-specific, it only affects a specific organ. Like, the, for example, um, it only affects your pancreas, your thyroid, or a specific organ inside our body. Unlike some of your autoimmune um, disorders, it, they can also be systemic, uh, meaning to say they are non-organ specific, like your systemic lupus erythematosus that can manifest in various organs, it, in your um, oral, um, oral cavities, in your skin. It can also affect your heart, your lungs, your kidney, even your blood, your muscles, and even your joints. Now, um, for this particular lecture, we will be starting off and we will be discussing first your systemic um, autoimmune diseases, um, specifically your systemic lupus erythematosus. Now, for the next discussion um, on our synchronous class, I will be uh, I will be talking about your rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, on our next lecture. But for now, let's talk about your systemic autoimmune diseases. To start off, uh, let's talk about your lupus erythematosus. Okay? Your lupus erythematosus. So these are the examples of your uh, systemic autoimmune diseases. We have your systemic lupus erythematosus, your uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and you also have your granulomatosis with polyangitis or your Wegener's granulomatosis. Now, uh, for our discussion for today, we will be talking about your systemic lupus erythematosus. So your systemic lupus erythematosus, um, being a systemic autoimmune disease, it involves multiple systems, multiple um, organ systems in an individual. So immune complexes, um, immune complex um, it is an immune complex disease characterized by the overproduction of your auto autoantibodies. So there are a lot of autoantibodies produced in your systemic lupus erythematosus. That's why also the reason why there are a lot of organ systems that are involved when we talk about your SLE. Now we're going to talk about the different autoantibodies later on as we also talk about how we diagnose or how we identify the presence of an auto of your SLE in a particular individual. Now, your systemic lupus erythematosus um, has a common manifestation as arthritis. So arthritis is the most common manifestation of your SLE. That's why um, a lot of people would um a lot of people would mistaken it minsan as your rheumatoid arthritis but those are two entirely different um entirely different autoimmune disease so um 
if you guys are reading your book and other references, your systemic lupus erythematosus are usually appearing um, around the age of 40 years old. Okay, If you're 40 and above, um, that's the time where your SLE is most um, common to appear. Okay, Most common to appear. Now, your SLE um, is also... Uh, manifesting not only as a as an arthritis, but it can also manifest itself as a skin lesion. So a characteristic, a distinct characteristic of patients with systemic lupus erythematosus is the presence of a butterfly rash. Okay, that's why um, patients um, that are having your SLE are also no are termed as your red wolf. Okay, your red wolf. So what is this um, characteristic? Um, charac Characteristic butterfly rash that are usually um, seen in patient, okay, in patient with SLE. Okay, so as you can see on your screen right now, this is your butterfly rash. This is not just a simple nag blush ka, or this is not just a simple sunburn. This are really rash on your nose and your cheeks. Okay, this butterfly rash or uh, the red rash or your um, the butterfly rash that you usually see um, in your patients. Okay, it's a, it's a distinct characteristic among patient. Okay, a distinct characteristic among patient with um, systemic lupus erythematosus. Okay, so always remember. Okay, always remember that this butterfly rash is very distinct when it comes to your SLE. Okay, when it comes to your SLE. So again, um, aside from um, your SL, aside from your butterfly rash, I also want you guys to remember that um, patients with SLE are usually women. Okay, women are most most likely to be affected than men. Okay, so nine is to ten is the ratio. So nine women and one um, nine is the ratio bit of SLE women to men, okay, women to men, men is 9 is to 1. So, sham na kababaihan, okay, ten, 9 out of 10 are women and only 1 out of 10 are men, okay, are men having your SLE. Now, it's very important, okay, it's very important that um, for you guys to uh, remember, diba, the characteristic um, rush for your um, SLE, again is your butterfly rush okay your butterfly rush now having said that um that your systemic lupus erythematosus is because of the presence of your um autoantibodies that can be because of your the loss of your self tolerance uh, probably because of hormonal um factors um uh, because of your um sometimes because it can also be idiopathic. Okay, idiopathic meaning to say there is no known reason unto why you're um, having your autoimmune or you're having your SLE. But in women, uh, if you guys could remember, we talk about your we talk about your um, hormones. Now, um, in women, okay, estrogen is one of the playing factor in the development of your systemic lupus erythematosus. But not only hormones, not um, sometimes it can also be um, unknown cause or idiopathic. But there are also drugs, okay, there are also drugs that are associated um, mainly to your lupus. So drugs like procainamide, your hydralazine, your chlorpromazine, your isoniazid, and your kinidine, these are um, drugs that can cause your lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus. Okay, systemic lupus erythematosus. Now, it's important, okay, to um, balance the clinical manifestation, but also um, the immunologic, um, immunologic uh, criteria for your SLE. So here is the criteria for your SLE. So we have your clinical and, of course, your immunologic um, criteria. When we say clinical, these are the signs and symptoms that are usually seen in your patient. And when we talk about your immunological criteria, we are now talking about the different laboratory tests or le different laboratory results that we can observe among patients with SLE. Now, to further explain this, okay, to further explain this, we will now be talking about the laboratory diagnosis. Of course, when it comes to the clinical manifestation, um, 
there are uh, there are um, different signs and symptoms. As you can see, it ranges from your oral um, cavity, your skin, literally system um, a systemic um, a systemic impact. Um, in our patient. Now, since we are medical technologists, let's focus in into the different immunologic criteria for your SLE. I'll go back to this slide in a short while. Now, when it comes to your laboratory diagnosis, okay, when it comes to the, your laboratory diagnosis, um, there are various ways on how we can um, diagnose your SLE. So we can uh, quantify your complement protein, specifically your C3. So C3 is the most commonly measured uh, complement protein. Okay, so when it comes to your C3, uh, we can quantify um, the levels of your C3 and associate that with your SLE. But most importantly, a more specific test. Okay, a more specific um, test for your SLE will be that the, the um, detection or the presence of anti-nuclear antibody, or we call this your ANA. Your ANA are group of antibodies that are usually being identified or being um, detected among patients with SLE. Now, aside from antibodies, we can also see the presence of your LE cells or your lupus erythematosus cell. So your LE cells are your polymorphonuclear cells. These are your neutrophils and sometimes even your macrophages that has an ingested LE body and often um, has a rosette formation. So um, to talk about, okay, to talk about your the laboratory diagnosis, for your systemic lupus erythematosus, let's start off with the presence of LE cells. So um, hematologically, uh, when you see your CBC, your peripheral blood smear, you can observe your LE cells. Your LE cells, again, is your lupus erythematosus cell. Your LE cells are also known as your Har Hargrave cell. Okay, These are neutrophils or macrophages that has engulfed or phagocyte, uh, phagocytized a denatured nuclear material of another cell. So why do we why do they have bakase? Or bakit bakase sila merong denatured nuclear material? So take for example there are cells that has the uh, denatured nuclear material, okay? It is because of the presence again of your anti-nuclear antibody. So there are ANA present in your uh, pre present in your patient that's why the nuclear material of other cells are being denatured. Okay, now this denatured nuclear material of other cell, when engulfed by your neutrophil and your macrophage, would present itself in a rosette formation like this one on your screen right now. And these are now the cells which we call your lupus erythematosus or your LE cells or Hargreaves cell. Now, sir, ibig sabihin, meaning to say, um, the reason why we have LE cell is because of the anti-nuclear antibody that denatured the nuclear materials of other cell. That's very correct. Okay. Now, okay. Um, as I mentioned a while back, okay. As I mentioned a while back, the presence of your ANA or your an anti-nuclear antibodies is the epitome or the is the um the preferred test in diagnosing your systemic lupus erythematosus. Now, let's talk about um, your ANA or your anti-nuclear antibodies now. So your ANA or your anti-nuclear antibodies, these are autoantibodies that are directed against antigen in the nuclei of mammalian cells, specifically us humans. Now, because of these autoantibodies, your ANA, they are specifically attack the nuclei of our mammalian cell. That's why there are um, denatured nuclear material that our neutrophil and macrophages engulf. Hence, the formation now of your LE cells. Now, because of this ANA, okay, because of this ANA, um, these um, nuclei or the nuclear materials are being denatured. And for a fact now, okay, your your ANA or your anti-nuclear antibody are the major marker of the major marker for the disease. Okay, a major marker for the disease. Um, specifically for your SLE, your rheumatoid arthritis, and even your Wegener's granulomatosis. Sir, um, if you say major marker for the disease, 
I am actually pertaining to the systemic autoimmune diseases. Why? Because these anti-nuclear antibodies are not specific. Not specific in a sense that they can all your rheumatoid arthritis also has a presence of ANA. Your um, other systemic autoimmune diseases they do have a presence of anti-nuclear antibody. So this anti-nuclear antibody again they target the nuclei of your mammalian cell, the nuclear material of our cells specifically, they can attack the double-stranded or the single-stranded DNA, your histones, okay, histones, the proteins, okay, in which your um, DNA are called, your nucleosomes, um, these are now the complex of your DNA and histones, your centromere proteins, and even your extractable nuclear antigen or your ENA. Um, your extractable nuclear antigen such as your ribonucleoprotein, your SM antigen or your Smith antigen, your SSARO antigen, your SSB slash LA antigen, your SCL70, JO1, and your PM1. These are examples of extractable nuclear antigen. Now, patients, oh, I just want to be clear people, ha? patients with SLE and rheumatoid arthritis can produce, okay, they do have, and we do have autoantibodies that targets these compounds or these molecules that are usually found in the nuclei of our mammalian cell. Okay, so again, ha? do not get confused with ENA. ENA, these are the antigens, okay? A group of nuclear antigens, okay, that are found inside our, our nucleus. Now, we have um, anti-nuclear antibody that can be directed against your ENA, against your DNA, your histones, your nucleosomes, or can also be for your centromere proteins, okay? Now, um, um, since we all know that, okay, the presence of your anti-nuclear antibody pala is a uh, marker, okay, a major marker for your for your SLE. How do we detect your ANA now? Okay, how do we detect your ANA now? Now, there are various methods on ANA detection. The first one that we're going to talk about for today is your FANA, okay, your FANA or your fluorescent anti-nuclear antibody. Okay, again, your FANA or your uh, your FANA test or your FANA testing or your fluorescent anti-nuclear antibody. Aside from your FANA, we also have your uh, micro, your MIA or your microsphere uh, multiplex immunoassay. We can also use your immunofluorescence, your Auster-Loney test. So most of the tests that we're going to talk about uh, will be mentioned later on. But again, let me just remind you that um, the most common test being used is your FANA, okay, or your FANA, okay, your fluorescent anti-nuclear antibody test. So it is a type of an indirect immunofluorescence test, okay, which is most widely used and accept, uh, accepted test in the diagnosis of your systemic lupus erythematosus, or in general in the detection of your ANA or your anti-nuclear antibody. So it uses your human epithelial cell line, specifically your HEP2 cells, um, which is the standard substrate for this particular test. Okay, So your fluorescent anti-nuclear antibody test um, is widely used in the laboratory because it's inexpensive and it is easy to perform. Okay, It is easy to Perform. Now, as you can see on the um, on your screen right now, on to your right, we have a slide. And on this slide um, is a fixated, we already we have a human epithelial cell line fixed to the slide. And this specific cell line is your HEP2 cells. Okay, your HEP2 um, cells is the um, source of your um, nuclear antigens. Okay, what nuclear antigens again? Like what I have mentioned kanina, um, the HEP2 cells. Okay, the HEP2 cells that is fixed on the slide contains your um, double-stranded DNA, your single-stranded DNA. It contains, in, in short, it contains the target of the different anti-nuclear antibody. So now that we have a 
uh, we have the substrate or we have the HEP2 cell line fixed on the slide, we would now apply okay, your patient serum. In your patient serum, okay, specifically take for example, your patient has your um, SLE. They would have antibody. Okay? They would have antibody, specifically your anti-nuclear antibody. Now, be, if your patient has SLE, they would have ANA. And this ANA will be the one that would react to your or would bind to the um to the HEP2 cells on your slide. Okay? Okay. So let me just translate that in Tagalog. No, dahil nga meron kang HEP2 cells na naka-fix on your fix on your slide, the antibody, okay, the ANA from your patient sample will now bind with your cell. Okay? Specifically to the different targets that we mentioned kanina, the DNA, the histones, the nucleosomes, the centromere or the extractable nuclear antigens. Now, um, how do we how are we able to um, identify if there is a binding that happened? We apply now a um, anti um, ANA, okay? Anti ANA. What do you mean by anti ANA? These are antibody directed against the anti nuclear antibody um, of the patient. Now, this anti-ANA has label. So again, the label specifically for this test are fluorescent, uh, fluorescent, fluorescent labels. Okay, they are fluorescent label. Remember, when we talk about your hypersensitivity, we have your RAS and we have your RIS. The label used there are radioactive label. Here, the one used this time are your fluorescent label, um, and um. The intensity, okay, the intensity of the the intensity and the pattern, okay, the intensity and the pattern of your fluorescence will now be determined, and we were we we will be able to identify what a specific ANA is present. Okay, so having said that, oh, let's just repeat, ha, huh? let's just a quick review. Um, in your slide, you have your HEP2 cell lines. These are, uh, it, they contain nuclear, um, they, they contain the nuclear antigen in which your ANA would react to. Now, if your patient has um, ANA, it would react to your HEP2 cell line. And for us to be able to visualize that, we will be using an anti-ANA with a fluorescent label. Okay, your fluorescent label. Now, okay. Um, how are we able to interpret the test? Okay, so I'll just show you is an example of a result. So as you can see, this is a result of your F, your FANA, okay? Your um, fluorescent antinuclear antibody test, okay? So as you can see, there are different patterns. And what is the significance of these patterns, okay? These patterns, okay, correspond to a specific um, anti-nuclear antibody. Sa madaling sabi, kapag ganito ang itsura ng ating um, FANA or ng, uh, ng ating results, it means that this corresponds to a specific anti-nuclear antibody. But before we go to that, what are the different nuclear patterns ba? Okay? What are the different nuclear patterns? So there are various nuclear patterns that we can observe when it comes to your FANA. So there are different patterns. It can be homogeneous or diffuse. So meaning to say um, it is uniform uh, stained or rather the entire nucleus is uh, fluorescing. Meaning to say um, homogeneous siya diffuse. So this is how it looks like. The entire nucleus are fluorescing. Now there can also be a fluorescence on the rim of the, of the nucleus which we call your peripheral. In your peripheral, diffuse staining is throughout the nucleus, but with greater intensity around the outer circle surrounding the nucleus. So meaning to say, it's just the peripheral of the nucleus. Okay. Second, it can also be speckled. In speckled, these are discrete fluorescent specks throughout the nucleus. These are... Um, um, Tiny, okay, speckled all throughout your nucleus. Okay, um, aside from a speckled pattern, it can also be a nucleolar pattern. Nucleolar pattern has a prominent staining of your nucleoli, okay, of your nucleoli. 
And finally, we also have your um, centromere pattern where you can see numerous discrete speckled are seen. Now, if you're going to differentiate your speckled pattern from your centromere pattern, the speckled pattern are more uh, discrete, okay? They are discrete and they are bigger compared to your centromere, okay? Remember, your centromere is just a, ano, diba? an, orga, uh, an organelle of the cell. They are generally smaller. So, when you see a centromere, okay, a smaller dots or a smaller um, dots on the, on the nuclear pattern, then that would mean that it is a centromere pattern. Okay, so now um, let us just try to ano, no, let's just try to encapsulate what we are we, what we have been talking. Now um, again, uh, let me just reiterate. No, in SLE, um, our patient has anti-nuclear antibody, and these anti-nuclear antibody are directed against your the nucleus the nucleus of our cells. Um, they can attack or they can bind to your doubles, your DNA, your histones, nucleosome, centromere, or they can um, bind to your extractable nuclear antigen, such as the following. Now, how do we identify that? We, uh, the most commonly used test is your FANA. Okay. Now, okay, uh, that we have discussed your FANA. Um, how can we identify, sir? How how would we know if they are uh, these an this anti-nuclear antibody are double-stranded antibody double-stranded DNA and anti-DS DNA or are they anti-single-stranded DNA or antibody against histone? How we um study the nuclear pattern? Okay, we study the nuclear pattern. So again, this is a homogeneous pattern. So as you can see, the entire nucleus is um the entire nucleus is fluorescing. So the fluorescence there, meaning to say, um, those are the antibody press that has bind to the nucleus. We also have your nuclear pattern. Okay, nuclear patterns, as you can see, they are uh, big enough. Ayan, big, malalaki sila. Okay, it um, binds to the nucleoli of the cell. And we also have your speckled. Ayan, this is your speckled pattern. Okay, so... How does it happen? Okay, so in your in your cell, in your slide rather, we have your slide. So take for example, um, each slide your your slide meron kang one, two, three, four, five, six. So these six um these six wells here, okay, the six wells that you can see here, guys, these are all HEP2 cells, okay? HEP2 cells or your epithelial cell line. So you drop your antibody, your, you drop your serum here, you drop your serum here, 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 and here. Now you allow your, um, your patient serum to incubate with the slide. And then if there is presence of anti-nuclear antibody, they would bind to your Nucleus, again, in different patterns. Some homogeneous, it can also be speckled, some are peripheral, some are nuclear. Now, for us to be able to visualize that, what are we going to add? We are going to add an anti-ANA, anti-ANA with fluorescent label. That's why we're able to help that's why we're able to visualize ah okay it's homogeneous ah okay it's speckled ah okay the pattern is peripheral ah okay the pattern is nuclear now the bigger question now is that what does this pattern signifies okay what does this pattern signifies on table 15-2 of your chapter 15 in your book you can see the different autoantibody so you have your anti dsdna that means it is an anti double stranded dna anti-single-stranded DNA, anti-histone, anti-DNP or deoxynucleoprotein, your anti-SM or your anti-Smith, which is an example of an extractable nuclear antigen, your anti-RNP, okay, RNP, um, you also have here um, or your RNP or your ribonucleoprotein, your anti-SSA, um, RO and other um, auto antibody. Now, since we're talking about systemic glucose erythematosus, 
Um, it's very important for you to familiarize yourself. Sir, so how do we memorize or how do we study the table? Of course, number one, you study the autoantibody. Okay, the, what are the different autoantibody? I think we, we mentioned this kanina, the different, and this, this autoantibody, these are your anti-nuclear antibody. Okay, so characteristic antigen, as you can see, they are directed against the double-stranded DNA. Okay, so what are their pattern? This is important. Okay, if the pattern is peripheral or the pattern is homogeneous, that means that the one you see are DS DNA. So let's go back. If you see this pattern, oh, this is homogeneous. Okay, the pattern is homogeneous, meaning to say the antibody that is present are anti DS DNA or anti double stranded DNA. Antibodies directed against the double stranded DNA of the cell. Okay, that's how you study that, or how that's how you study this table. Okay, it's important for you to remember the immunofluorescent pattern. Now, what about for SLE? What are the autoantibody? What are the anti-nuclear antibodies that are specific? Okay, to SLE. Just like what I mentioned kanina, your ANA are non-specific, but um, with knowing the correct immunolog, the correct um nuclear pattern you're able to identify which one are specific for SLE. Those are your anti-DSDNA, okay, your anti-Smith, okay, and your antibody, okay, autoantibody against your anti-centromere, okay. So as you can see here, guys, um, um, it your anti-DSDNA is specific for SLE. Your anti-Smith is also a diagnostic for SLE. Your autoantibody or your anti-centromere is also specific for your um for your Crest syndrome, specifically your calcinosis, Raynaud's phenomenon, esophageal dysmotility, scleral ductility, and telangiectasia. Okay, telang uh, telangiectasia. So these are also system these are now a combination of different diseases okay now um identified as also your sle now as you can see ha your dsdna peripheral and homogeneous so if you see peripheral and homogeneous it means that it is for your sle okay um it means that it has the presence of anti-DSDNA specific for SLE. If you observe quartz speckled, okay, quartz speckled, then that would mean, okay, that that is for your SLE. Okay, if presence of anti-Smith, the anti-DSDNA, all specific for SLE. As you can see, the other anti-nuclear antibody present just sa SLE. Yes, it is present in your SLE, but it can also be seen in other diseases. That's why if you're going to look at a specific laboratory result, even if you see that there's presence of anti-single-stranded DNA, presence of anti-histone, you always look at the DSDNA and your anti-Smith just for you to be able to make sure that it is indeed SLE. As you can see, I also want you guys to take note, uh, you also have here drug-induced um, SLE. You can see antihistone, anti-DNP, okay? And as you can see, other, auto and, um, other anti-nuclear antibody are also present in other diseases. That's why, again, ha, it's important for you to remember anti-DSDNA and anti-Smith and also your anti-centromere. So again, that is your um, fluorescent anti-nuclear antibody test. Okay, so with the different nuclear patterns, we're able to identify the specific auto-antibody. Now, moving forward, okay, hopefully um, you understood how we interpret. So again, if you see these patterns, okay, if you see these patterns um, in your FANA test, you would know, okay, what are the specific anti-nuclear antibody that they represent, okay? So aside from FANA, okay, it, this part now will just be a quick um, run-through of the different tests that can be used to identify your anti-nuclear antibody. So FANA test is just one, okay? We just spent more time there because it is the most commonly used in the laboratory. But aside from FANA, we can also make use of your microscope peer multiplex immunoassay. So it uses a micro titer plate uh, containing suspension of your polystyrene microspear 
uh, that are coated with individual nuclear antigen or with HEP2 extra. So kanina, we have a set, we have a slide in which we have a fixed HEP2 cells on those specific slides. Here, what we have are microtiter plate. So you have a well and um, on the well, we have um, the specific nuclear antigens na mismo na um, fixed on the web. So instead of having um, different patterns to study in your microsphere multiplex immunoassay, you can simply just see, okay, in which specific well your um, specific well your uh, patient serum reacted. It's more similar with your RAS, your radioallegrosorbent test. There are already specific allergen on the well, di ba? Here, there's already specific nuclear antigen in the well and you can simply identify what specific um, antibody is present based on the result. So the antibody in your present will bind only to the bead containing a speci specified antigen. Take for example, you have a well that contains your DSDNA. If the antibody reacted to that, you would see um, a positive result on that particular on that particular um, well. Okay, so um, similarly, we are using a anti-human IgG, so meaning to say another antibody directed against your anti-nuclear antigen, uh, rather anti-nuclear antibody. So the bead suspension is analyzed for fluorescence. So if there, um, if take for example, there's fluorescence in, in the particular well that contains your DSDNA, that would mean that your patient has anti-DSDNA. Okay, so one that identifies each bead and the other that detects the amount of fluorescence conjugate attach. Okay, so again, it's very the your MIA is very similar with your um, RAS. It has a specific um, nuclear antigen in each well. So once your anti-nuclear antibody bind to that, you will be able to identify what specific ANA is present. Okay, so aside from FANA, we have your MIA or your microsphere multiplex um, immunoassay. We also have your immunofluorescence using your Crithidia lucillae. So I want you guys to remember your Crithidia lucillae. Your Crithidia lucillae is a trypanosome that has a circular organelle, which we call your kinetoplast, that is mainly composed of your double-stranded DNA. That's why, okay, um, remember that the kinetoplast of your Crithidia lucillae will fluoresce when um, your DSDNA bind to that. So how do we do your um, immunofluorescence using your Crithidia lucillae? So we have your trypanosome, okay, we have your Crithidia lucillae, and then we allow our patient's um, serum to react with this um, organism or this trypanosome. Um, specifically, um, the Crithidia lucillae only contains double-stranded DNA. It contains double-stranded DNA. Now, because it contains double-stranded DNA, oh, remember, your anti-DSDNA is a diagnostic marker for your SLE. Meaning to say, if your antibody um, antibody or the anti-nuclear antibody of your patient reacted with your Crithidia lucillae or your trypanosome, it means that the patient has anti-DS DNA. And because of that, sir, how are we going to visualize that? Again, we use, okay, we also use here an anti, um, anti, um, an anti ANA that has a fluorescent label. Okay, so if your antibody, your antibody to DSDNA is present, you would see your Crithidia lucillae fluorescing. So if you do not have, okay, if the Crithidia lucillae is negative or it doesn't fluoresce, meaning to say your patient doesn't have DSDNA. So most probably um, it is a different um, anti-nuclear antibody or it is negative to SLE. In short, okay? So again ha, ang ating Crithidia lucillae mag fluoresce lang kapag present ang anti-DS DNA. Okay? So again, that is for your immunofluorescence using your Crithidia lucillae. Aside from that, 
you also have your outstar loni test so no need to bother when it comes to outstar loni test because we will be discussing this uh when we go to your immunodiffusion in the semifinals. So your outstar loni test is a type of immunodiffusion test used to determine an immunologic specificity of your positive FANA. So take for example, you have, um, this is usually done, if, if you guys could observe, no, there are some um, anti-nuclear antibody with the same um, immunofluorescent pattern or nuclear pattern. Like take for example, um, a lot of these are um, homogeneous a lot of them are speckled. So for you to be able to identify what specific anti-nuclear antibody is that, okay, after FANA, okay, after your um, fluorescent anti-nuclear antibody test, you proceed with outster loni test. In your outster loni test, we are able to identify the identity of your antibody, okay? So you can identify your Smith, your RNP, your SSA, your SSB, your SCL70, and your JO1. Again, that is your outster loni test. Ha? Your outster loni test is used to identify the specific um, specific nuclear anti-nuclear antibody present in your patient. Because again, um, your DSDNA, di ba? Kita mo naman, it can, uh, pag peripheral or homogeneous, that's only SLE. That's only for DSDNA. But for others, um, like your Smith, um, your RNP, both are coarsely speckled. In your SSA, SSB, how are you going to differentiate one from the other? You see um, both, both of them are finely speckled. Again, what you do is perform your outster loni test. Okay? Again, perform your outster loni test. Now, aside from the presence of your anti-nuclear antibody, okay, so those are the procedure or those are the methods on how we identify your anti-nuclear antibody. Again, we have your FANA, we have your um, your MIA or your uh, microsphere uh, multiplex immunoassay, and we also have the immunofluorescence test using your Carthidia lucile and of course your Ouch-Turloni test. Now, aside from your anti-nuclear antibodies, what else can we observe in patients with SLE? They also have presence of your anti-phospholipid antibody. Your anti-phospholipid antibody are antibodies that bind to your phospholipid alone or the phospholipid complex with protein. Um, although the problem with your anti-phospholipid antibody is it is also non-specific. Non-specific in a sense that um, your anti-phospholipid antibody can also be identified um, in other um, diseases like syphilis, okay, um, syphilis, um, even your rheumatoid arthritis, you can also observe presence of antiphospholipid antibody. But why is it where why are we using antiphospholipid antibody? Um, antiphospholipid antibody can serve as a um, a screening test in many levels. So take for example, you tested for. Uh, you tested positive for antiphospholipid antibody. Usually, would, we would suspect syphilis, okay? We would suspect syphilis. But if the patient is negative for syphilis, then that would now alert your doctor that they need to perform a series of tests to identify are these an antiphospholipid antibody uh, because of um, syphilis or because of lupus or because of other autoimmune diseases, okay? So aside from antiphospholipid antibody, what else can we observe in patient, okay? What a laboratory, um, what laboratory test or laboratory result can we still observe in patient with SLE? We can also observe your, the presence of your lupus anticoagulant. If you are in my class in hematology 2, um, we have mentioned your lupus anticoagulant um, um, last meeting, um, so in your lupus anticoagulant, remember both your um, pro time, okay, your your rather your prothrombin time, baka hindi kayo familiar sa pro time, your pro time or your prothrombin time and your activated partial thromboplastin are both um, both increase, okay, or both prolong. Now, how are we able to identify if these are um, coagulation factor deficiency? When you perform your substitution study, okay, which I will be discussing to you guys um, this week on Thursday or Friday, depending on your section, we will be discussing how do we identify um, lupus anticoagulant. 
Okay? So again, um, with respect to immunology, with respect to SLE, patient with systemic lupus erythematosus has your lupus anticoagulant. So there are two markers in HEMA that we can observe, no? the presence of your LE cells and the presence of your lupus anticoagulant. Again, how do we identify the presence of your lupus anticoagulant? Um, both your PT and PTT are increased. Is there baka, it's just as a matter of a, co a coagulation factor deficiency that belongs to the common pathway. Um, your, your analogy or your analysis is partly correct. But again, when we perform your substitution studies, again, to be discussed this coming Thursday and Friday, you would observe that it is not corrected. Okay, it is not corrected. So with lupus anticoagulant, it increases the risk of clotting in, um, in, patient, in women. It increases the possibility of a spontaneous abortion. So again, presence of lupus anticoagulant is um, observed in patients with SLE together with the presence of antiphospholipid antibody and of course the marker for your um, SLE is the presence of your anti-nuclear antibody. Now which lead us now to the criteria for your SLE. The different criteria for your SLE can be clinical, the different symptoms or it can also be immunologic. Again, elevated ANA. Now since we're talking about ANA, there are a lot of anti-nuclear antibody there are two specific anti-nuclear antibody that are um, marker for SLE. That is elevated DSDNA. So meaning to say when you do your FANA, there is a fluorescence or homogeneous or peripheral uh, nuclear pattern. You're also present for anti-Smith antibody. Again, when you perform your FANA, you still need to do your Outsterlone test to identify the presence of your anti-Smith. There's also the presence of antiphospholipid antibody, although not specific for SLE, but you can observe that low comp complement protein, low complement protein specifically, uh, low C3 levels, and of course, positive that in the absence of hemolytic anemia. Now, always remember that according to the Systemic Lupus International Collaborating Clinics, a patient must satisfy at least four of this clinical and immunologic criterion for them to be declared or for them to be diagnosed with SLE. Again, four out of the 17, at least, okay, at least four out of the 17, um, 17 um, criterion, okay, uh, four out of the 17 criteria. So kung apat, meron kang present ng apat na to out of 17, then that could be declared as systemic lupus erythematosus. Okay, so I hope that's clear, everyone. So we talk about your systemic lupus erythematosus. For our next meeting, we will be talking about um, your, we'll be talking about your rheumatoid arthritis and other organ-specific autoimmune diseases. For now, thank you so much for listening. So that is it for today. Thank you so much, and I will see you on our next synchronous class this week. I right, thank you so much and have a great day.